Good afternoon to everybody. Mike Haggerty here alongside with Mike Clayton and uh, special guest, Dr. Nate Zinzer. And Doc, uh, it's such a pleasure, man, to have you on this call. And uh, not, to, not to really, you know, create any nervous tension here, but we've had Olympic champions and we've had uh, Olympic level coaches on this call, but I personally am probably most excited about this call. Uh, when, I, when I got the, uh, I got a text message from Mike Clayton uh, not long ago about a book that he shared. And uh, so I started to dig into the book and I said, my gosh, Mike, we have got to get this guy on our podcast. And he said, uh, without a doubt, let's do it. So it's been in the works for a, a couple of months, but man, we sure appreciate you jumping on this call and uh, sharing some of your wisdom with us. Well, I am delighted to be here, fellas, anytime. I get to talk wrestling, talk with wrestlers, talk with wrestling coaches. Uh, I jump on it. I, I give talks at, you know, sports clinics and, and business gatherings all the time. But there's nothing like talking to a group of wrestlers. Uh, I make no bones about it. Being an ex-wrestler, um, a refugee from New Jersey. I won the Jersey Prep League my senior year um, in high school. Wrestling was one of the great experiences of my life. And I think that there are things that wrestling teaches that, you know, that you really don't find in, in, in other sports. Um, so I'm happy to promote this, this sport, happy to promote your organization. If I was president of the United States, one of my top three priorities would make sure that every damn school in the country had wrestling mats and wrestling coaches and a mandatory curriculum so that every kid gets a taste of wrestling, boys and girls, right through high school, um, because it's such a valuable experience. Well, you probably just increased our listenership really right there by just saying that, Dr. Z, so thanks. But uh, you and Mike have a very special relationship, so why don't we uh, kick this off by just talking about your connection and how you guys got started to kind of know, know each other. Sure. Um, Mike Clayton, despite being a graduate of that other service academy, um, it came around to the, to the bright side of the force and became an assistant coach at West Point. Um, in that role, he and I got to interact uh, considerably. Uh, I directed a program of mental toughness training at West Point for 30 years um, at, in our Center for Enhanced Performance. I'm a sports psychology PhD. Um, I'm an old school sports psychology PhD, which means I came out of the health and physical education program. I'm not a shrink, okay? Um, mental health is a hugely important topic, but there's a precursor to mental health. And that's just sort of the psychology of performing well, the psychology of training, the psychology of being a good competitor. Um, I was engaged in that and I'm still engaged in that. Um, and that's how I met Mike Clayton. Uh, I'm proudly wearing my Army wrestling swag. You know, this, this is important to me. I will be I will be Matt's side on February 19th, I believe it is, for the Army-Navy dual meet at West Point. Um, Clayton, you're welcome to show up and be embarrassed by the boys in black. Uh, I'll wear my letter sweater for Navy. <laughs> there you go. Uh, it, it'll be wonderful. Uh, so I've known Mike for years. Um, we collaborated in mentoring uh, a lot of young men during his years at West Point. Uh, and we've kept in touch through his, uh, his coaching career, starting at Stevens Tech in Hoboken, New Jersey. And then here he is with USA Wrestling doing great stuff. So it's wonderful to be talking with him here. Well, you know, um, meeting Nate through that opportunity in wrestling, one of the greatest things about our sport are the people that we meet. It, by far, it is the best thing in my sport. And those connections that I think, at least that I notice that I tend to make in wrestling, they're connections for a lifetime. You know, it may be a couple of years before we you know, send a text or catch up, but as soon as we do, we click right back where, we're at, where we were at. I get to know what you've been working on. You get to know what I've been working on. And then somehow that always creates a better energy working together. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I remember just the, the presentations that you started to give our wrestling team at West Point. Um, you talked about your background in wrestling and how big uh, the influence wrestling had been on your life. And 
how much it had taught you in the world of mindset. Um, I in the book that I had sent Coach Haggerty, Confident Mind, um, awesome stuff, and, and a lot of stories about wrestling. Yes, indeed. But it, would, is that like the baseline, and then everything else goes from there, or does it just happen to be that wrestling has been around your circle? Um, wrestling has been central to my development as an athlete, as an individual, and really wrestling was central in my develop in the development of my interest in the in the field of sports psychology. Really looking at the the study of how thought processes, belief systems, et cetera, et cetera, affect human performance. Um, I had an experience in the final match of my high school career where I entered what is commonly referred to as the zone or flow or a peak experience. Um, and in that state of mind, I executed the winning takedown in the final period, 16 seconds on the clock, I executed the most perfect takedown of my entire career. But interestingly enough, fellas, it was one that I had hardly ever practiced. But it was textbook perfect. It, my mind was so clear. I was able to read my opponent so accurately. It was almost like we were puppets being directed by some superior intelligence. It just was bang. And I had him. And I can still feel my hand on the back of his leg shooting that left side high crotch and then getting around him and taking him down. And the frustration of that poor, poor fella um, pounding on the mat, you know, when the, when, when, the, when the clock finally ticked down. So, you know, that experience really highlighted to me the, the importance of the right state of mind and how it liberates ability and talent. And we talk about how important it is to be confident, to be focused, to be composed, but we tend not to actually work on it. We tend to not actually take steps to improve our certainty in the moment, to improve our clarity of thought. We think that's going to happen automatically as a byproduct of running a lot, lifting a lot, drilling a lot. And, you know, sometimes that does happen. But really, when you think about it, why would you want to leave something as important as your confidence, your focus, your composure? Why would you want to leave that up to chance? Why do you just sort of expect that to happen? If it's as important as people say it is, well, then dad going to do something about it. And that's what I've been doing, you know, in my career, you know, for almost 40 years now. I'm doing something about it, trying to teach people to take this seriously. Um, and I was very fortunate to be at West Point for 30 years. Uh, produce this book, have a lot of, have a few wrestling stories in it, as well as some lacrosse stories, some military stories, some track stories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Olympics, yeah. Dr. Z, quick question, um, not to make light of this, but what, what can you tell our coaches and other people out there that's dialing in on this podcast? What can you tell them? What is confidence? I mean, we th we think we have a general understanding of what confidence represents, but what is confidence and what is not confidence? Well, I define confidence in a sort of functional context. Confidence is a sense of certainty that you have about yourself that allows you to bypass conscious thought and pretty much execute your skill set unconsciously. You know? A sense of certainty, that means you can do something without having to think your way through it and talk your way through it and break it down and work hard at it. Um, you think about the example I use in the book is tying one's shoes. Tying the shoes is a very precise skill. There are a lot of bones, joints, nerve endings, muscles, connective tissue. That's a complicated activity. Once upon a time, you had to be very deliberate and think your way through it to make sure that you had the right level of tension at each eyelet, that you had enough lace at the end and you were doing not right. But at some point you decided, OK, I know how to do this and I'm certain. And now you can tie your shoes, you know, while having a conversation and you can do it perfectly and you can do it quickly. Now, think about having that same degree of certainty about that left side high crotch 
or about your ability to run the pipe when you know when you get the leg how about just being able to be automatic and intuitive and instinctive on the mat and every wrestler will tell you oh when i hit that moment that's when i'm really good but let's develop a sense of certainty about ourselves so there isn't that voice of doubt that little hesitation what what one of my colleagues at west point called the screaming ninny that's in the back of a lot of people's heads you know We've got to get rid of that if we're going to find out how good we are. That's a long-winded ex- answer to your question. No, that's, that's fantastic. What What is not confidence? Ah, uh, not but what isn't confidence is just sort of outspoken arrogance about yourself. You know, chest beating, theatricality. Oh yeah, I'm really great. I'm really great. Um, there are people who can say that on the outside, but do they have it on the inside? Do they actually have that sense of certainty about themselves? Or is this outward expression, this sort of bravado, is that just a cover-up for the fact that mm, maybe deep down they don't feel all that secure. They don't feel all that certain about themselves. Um, Sounds like ego gets in the way a little bit here. uh, Ego can be a huge threat to confidence and authenticity in the moment. Absolutely. Hmm. Dr. Z, how, how and, and I read some really great sort of processes so far in the book, and like I mentioned earlier before we actually went live, is that I apologize that I haven't had a chance to complete the book, but I found it so intriguing that I kept going back and rereading or re-listening in my case that I've got it on audio. But um, these steps to, to help develop confidence for an athlete, it, to me, uh, is sort of like what most of our, I think a lot of our coaches would be very interested in. And so what are some of those steps or processes that we can use to help build confidence? Okay. Um, First and foremost, get good at managing your memories about your career in general, going back to the start, about yesterday's practice or training session, you know, and then even within a practice or a training session, be really good at managing your memories of what just happened. And when I say manage your memories, I'm thinking about filtering the things that your thoughts about what has happened. Okay. We have something called free will as human beings. We can choose to think about whatever we want. Nobody's holding a gun to our head and saying, okay, you have to think about Five, five red apples and four yellow bananas. Nobody's doing that. We have free will to think about whatever we, we, we choose. So I think it's very important for coaches to emphasize to your athletes at the end of every practice, ask yourself, where in this practice did I put in quality effort? And maybe you write that moment down. Yeah, it was during this set. It was during this run. It was during this interval. Yeah, I really, I, I really bore down there. Secondly, ask your athlete, what little thing or things did you get right today? Yep, I didn't let anybody get to my legs, you know? Oh, I turned this guy for the first time in practice when we were drilling really hard. Um, Small successes. And then think about what you tend to, what are you making progress in? What areas of of the sport are you just getting a little bit better at? Yesterday, the day before, this week? What are you making progress in? Effort, success, progress, a daily ESP reflection. Everybody can do that. It takes two minutes. And it's a valuable way of you gaining that sense of certainty about yourself. It's almost like, and I use the analogy in the book, putting money in the bank. Every every thought about quality effort, every thought about a little success, every thought about progress that you're making, that's like a deposit into a bank account. And you want to do that day after day, week after week, month after month. It builds you up. It builds up your sense of who you are. And then when it's time to step on the mat and compete, okay, you've got some reasons to believe in yourself. Okay. Well, uh, one of the best conversations I've had since the book came out was with uh, Ryan Holiday, the guy who does the Daily Stoic uh, podcast and has written a lot about the importance of ancient Stoic philosophy in the modern world. And and he was really struck with the fact that, you know, 
my book and my work really encourages people to look for evidence that justifies a little confidence. Look for that evidence. If you look for it and you've put in any kind of quality effort at all, you're going to find it. But unfortunately, we sometimes overlook the effort that we've put in, the successes that we've had, the progress that we're making. We kind of overlook and discount that. Oh, yeah, it's not really any big deal because I'm not as good as so-and-so or I'm not ranked as high as so-and-so or I haven't had the kind of success that I think I should have. Um, look for evidence of your own capability. Manage your memories at the end of every practice so that you're building that sense of certainty. You can even do it within a practice. You know, you finish a drill. Okay, you had 20 reps of a technique. Which was your best one? For 10 seconds, will you simply remember your best rep in that drill before you go off to the next drill? Isn't that what you want in the future? More of that best rep? Well, remember it. Hang on to it a little bit. You know, that keeps your enthusiasm up over a long practice. Does that happen during the practice for our coaches? Am I going to stop what I'm doing? focus on this moment, create this teachable moment, and then allow practice to resume. Absolutely. You know, okay, fellas, we just, we just worked really hard here. Okay. Everybody focused right now. Your best rep, your best rep, your best rep, because you know, as well as I fellas, that the tendency is when a drill is over, you're either going to remember the final rep of that drill or the tendency is to remember the worst rep of the drill. You think about that in your own experiences. And I think most coaches will agree. The tendency is to hang on to the memory of the of, of the biggest booger, you know, that, that you just committed rather than the best rep that you had, you know. And it's not gonna it's not gonna disrupt the flow of a practice, it's not gonna slow things down, you know. It's as we're moving into position for the next drill. Fellas, hang on to your best rep. And then at the end of practice, during the cool down. Okay. Fellas, we're done. Get out your notebooks. Write down your ESP. Make those deposits in the bank account. That's something any coach can teach their, their wrestlers. That's pretty powerful. Coach Haggerty, how much of a flow of practice happened when you, in your coaching situations and even now coaching? How much did you stop to recognize these positives and encourage the positives to be remembered? The athletes. I think a lot of coaches may do this without knowing how important it is. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a great question, Michael. I, I, I believe that probably not enough, to be real honest with you, probably didn't do it enough. But I can remember those particular moments where we did have that, um, that moment of sort of like almost celebration of somebody doing something or accomplishing something that stood out in the moment. And it was always like, it was, it was rejoiceful. It was like, everybody jumped on board with that. It's like, yeah, that's pretty cool that Johnny was able to uh, do something in practice that he hadn't done before. And we celebrated it, you know? And so I'm sure that as that imprints in the brain of Johnny, that was a significant factor because if I can still remember some of those moments, I'm certain that those individuals could remember those moments. And probably had a huge impact on confidence at that particular time that, you know, hey, this is something that, and again, in the process, because you asked earlier, Mike, about practice, right? And about, yeah, it is this where it's developed? And, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think that that's, that's exactly where it's developed. That, and that's something that in this particular book, Dr. Z, that I would agree with the, the individual that you spoke with is that I hadn't really thought a lot about relating back to those moments of success, those moments that will help build the confidence. You know, we can ha create step-by-step -step processes, but one of the baselines is to go back and to try to remember those special moments that are encouraging, that creates those, the stair-step ladder approach of actually gaining some momentum and confidence. So I think that's, that's a, a good point, Michael. And, you know, it's like, as I was thinking about that, when you asked that question, is that probably just not enough, probably should have done it more often. Sure. When Doc Z, one of the things that your book talks about is that this confidence level, it's not fixed. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, let yeah let's let's throw that myth out the window. <laughs> the, the idea that once I gain a certain level of confidence, I'll have it forever. No, 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 no. Confidence is really fragile. Again, you got to think about confidence, that sense of certainty, that really is a function of how you're thinking about yourself. You got to think of confidence as like the running total, the ever changing running total of what you think about yourself. So if you, you know, if you have a lousy day in the room and you walk out of the room thinking, boy, that was a really lousy day. I must not be very good. You go, you know, you go down that rabbit hole. Okay. You just lowered your confidence. Maybe you, maybe you strengthened it yesterday or the day before or last week, or last month, but now you have reduced it. Now you diminished it. So this is, I can't emphasize this enough. It's a long haul process, fellas. It's a constant thing. All right. It's not, um, this came to me from one of the wrestlers at West Point. He finally realized in his senior year, I wish he had come to this conclusion in his sophomore year. He would have finished much better. But he can't, He finally realized in his senior year that, you know, confidence was not a, you know, decisive victory, to put it in military terms. You know, there's no atomic bomb that you can drop on the enemy and the war is over. The struggle for confidence is more like an ongoing war of attrition. There's this insurgency that's just there. And you have got to be aware of it. And you've got to fight that insurgency. And you've got to be building it and building it and building it and building it. Because wrestling is hard. Life is hard. And both of those things are going to beat you up, find your weaknesses, and challenge your ability to think constructively about yourself. Dr. Z, you, you mentioned... Like in, we started this sort of conversation in regards to of uh, of sort of a self analysis, but is it is it generally accurate how people judge their own confidence? Are people pretty aware of where they're at, or are there some other ways to determine what true confidence is? Like like you say, some people probably have the outward appearance of having confidence, but inwardly not so much. Uh, but is there a is there a way to determine is my is it a reality for me? Am I judging my confidence correctly? Uh, do I need to to continue? Of course, we know we all need to continue to probably work on our confidence. But is that something that we accurately can assess? Um, I think you can accurately assess it if you are indeed honest with yourself. You know? what do I say to myself as I'm walking into the room to practice? What do I say to myself 24 hours before a match? What do I say to myself five minutes before I'm taking the mat? What do I say to myself when I roll off the mat? You know, the whistle blows and we're, we're coming back to the middle. Okay. We have to be very honest with our thoughts. And everybody has that ability. So a lot of us don't use it. A lot of us ignore or... I guess, avoid actually asking themselves, okay, what's going through my head in these moments? Do those thoughts make me feel energetic and optimistic about myself? Do those thoughts free me to be loose and reactive the way the sport demands? Or do those thoughts tighten me, tense, and tense me up? Do those is my thinking constructive? Is my thinking creating energy, optimism, enthusiasm for myself? And this is just something that everybody's got to be uh, personally honest with, you know. And a lot of times, I, I've you know spoken with dozens of wrestlers. And it's like, yeah, I used to think I was kind of confident, but now when I really ask myself, what's going through my head? No, man, I'm, I'm, I'm dreading competition. I used to, I used to really like it. Now I'm discovering that there's a lot of other people just as physically gifted and hardworking as I am. Hmm. 
I guess I got to really find a way to separate myself from those guys. Uh, and the way you do that is by making sure that you think more effectively, that you have a better mind than your opponent. I appreciate oh, the answer to your question, Hags. Sorry. No, man, I think that was really good because I do think that at times dealing with certain athletes, they have not really internalized that. They haven't really, uh, you know, if you ask them probably on a scale of one to 10, let's just say, which is for no other reason I picked that number, but if you assess yourself where you stand with confidence, I think the average athlete would give you feedback that they were seven, eight, nine, whatever. I don't know. But um, I don't know that that would be an accurate assessment, you know, when watching and how they demonstrate, how they approach practice, how they approach competitions. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just a kind of a quick follow up. I know, Michael, you had something you wanted to ask, but how important would that be in, in regards to like journaling, like putting those thoughts on paper and assessment during the, is that something that you would advocate? Oh, I'm a huge uh, advocate for journaling. You know, I believe it was Plato who said the unexamined life is not worth living. Um, mm -hmm. If you're going to live this life, you might as well apply a little self-awareness. And mm -hmm. journaling is a really good way of doing that. Uh, I encourage that daily reflection, ESP, as a journaling exercise. Okay. And you can also add a few other things if you're curious. Uh, you can take ESPN and turn it, ESP, turn it into ESPN and be, what am I going to get after next? What am I going to get after tomorrow? Everybody can remember ESPN, for, for Pete's sake. Um, another piece of journaling is, okay. Um, what am I grateful for? Mm -hmm. Let's reflect on the blessings that I do have. You know, do I have some talent? Do I have some training opportunities? Do I have friends? Do I have coaches? Do I have mentors? Do I have parents who, get, who care about me? Do I have a couple of close friends? Let's, let's be grateful for the fact that, hey man, we're living in the United States. This is not Kiev, you know? We're, we're, we're freaking lucky right here. Let's, let's not overlook that. That changes the mood. So I think, you know, to answer your question, I journaling is huge in my book. Love it. Well, I, I, I think part of the reason I wrote my training log was because I was working with you and that was such an encouraging piece of the puzzle was making time to reflect. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people, you know, whether I talked with one coach and he said, you know, we reflect too much on our successes and we don't reflect enough on our on our failures. And then I had another coach say, we don't spend enough time with our successes because we're looking on to go to the next step. And so it seems like the common theme that I hear is that we're not reflecting at all. Mm -hmm. the pace has become so fast. The next thing has become so important. So how do we how do we make this a priority and how do we build time into the day to to kind of look through this reflection? Yeah. Um I don't think it's possible to make anything a priority. There's no technique to that. Something is worth doing or something isn't worth doing. It's pretty it's pretty black and white if if uh, in in my understanding. Um I think there's plenty of time in the day for reflection. Maybe it means you spend a little less time on Facebook or chit chat or whatever the heck. Um, there's time. Okay. And it doesn't take a lot of time, but you know, we get, we get seduced by, you know, social media. We get seduced by, all these options that are available, you know, Netflix, HBO, Max, boy, do we have a, just a, a 24 seven bombardment of information. Um, again, it comes back to the honesty question that Hags was mentioning. Like, is this really good for you? Is this actually helping you? You know, no, I, I again, I'm all for recovery, you know, you got to work hard in the room and then you got to take some time away from the room. Um, so I'm not saying that all social media is bad and I'm not saying it at all. 
you know, streaming movie ser uh, services are a blight upon humanity. Uh, I just believe that you've got to decide what really matters. You know? What really matters? Does your confidence matter? Well, then spend five minutes a day journaling to build it up. I think it's time well spent. I'm going to pull a Yogi Berra because he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it, right? Um, I'm going to throw both of them out, and I'm going to let you pick which side of the fork that you go down. <laughs> All right, Clayton, go ahead. For confidence, you talk a lot about this visualization, and everything I heard you say was me visualizing comparing myself. How do I feel from today to tomorrow? What are my thought processes today, tomorrow? I didn't hear you talking about me comparing myself to the person that's across the map that's you know built like a truck and I'm like, oh no, you know, like so it sounded like these comparisons are measuring ourselves over time. So that's one fork. And then the other fork for the parents that might be listening. You know, a lot of times today, the parents and the kids put so much into wrestling. It's my all year, every day thing. It's our family's money. It's our vacations. Like our whole life revolves around wrestling. And so when when this pressure that an athlete may feel, not necessarily intentional, but the pressure that an athlete may feel because it's almost like we professionalize youth wrestling. How big of an emotional play is that on an athlete's confidence, even if it's not intentional? Okay, two very important questions. First of all, the comparison issue, comparing yourself to others only holds you down. Okay, let's not compare yourself to, you know, RBY, Gable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, let's 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 because you can't be that person you can only be the best version of yourself are you getting better are you making progress yeah i suppose you know you have a role model out there but as i said in the book and i don't know where i first heard this if you have a hero the best you can ever be is second place okay if if, if you put somebody up on a pedestal you're always gonna feel some distance. No, put yourself up on the pedestal. You know, I have seen my hero and he or she is me. Okay. So let's, let's get out of this comparison. Okay. Let me, it's fine to learn something from the way another wrestler sets up or shoots or finishes. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Now let's get excited about doing it myself as opposed to only thinking, Oh my gosh, that guy's so good. Oh my God, that guy's so slick. Oh my God, that, that guy's so smooth. Um, I hope that answers that question at least a little bit. Now, to the pressure question. Yeah. Um, wrestling is supposed to be fun. It's, I mean, I think that's why kids start out. Oh, it's really cool to get on the mat and roll and, you know, take a guy down. And it's really fun to have your hand raised at the end of a match. You know, boy, that's a great feeling. Okay. Let's, let's let's remember that that's why we started, okay? And if our practice and if our camp schedule and if our family schedule is interfering with that fun, then maybe it's time to start to try something else, okay? And every time I meet with a parent, any every any time I counsel uh, an athlete, basically under the age of eighteen. You know, I'm there with mom and dad. Say, look, it's got to be fun. That's your foundation. On top of that foundation, you can build the idea of gaining te technical skill, improving your skill set. On top of those two steps, you can think about, oh, enjoying competition, any kind of competition. Only when you have those three criteria satisfied, can you really look at uh, pursuing competitive excellence. Sometimes we just pursue per competitive excellence and we forget about that underlying principle of fun and getting better at the sport and we sacrifice a lot. Um, I am still a believer that a kid under the age of, you know, I think 16, 17, you should play more than one sport. You should play more than one sport. 
you're going to avoid overuse injuries if you play if you wrestle part of the year and then i don't know play baseball play lacrosse play play a sport where you got to interact with other people you know you can't do hockey because it's the same time of year um but play play another sport besides just wrestling it's good for you it's good for your body to get a break it's good for your body to learn other motor skills it's good for your brain and your emotions to be with different coaches who communicate with you in a different way um it really rounds you out better and you will be a better athlete once you specialize say first year of college you'll be better at that stage if you have spent your 12 13 14 15 16 17 year in more than one sport that you, that range of activities is very important that will ultimately make you better at what you specialize in some people thumb their nose at me when i say that um but i think there's plenty of evidence there there's a wonderful book entitled range that deals with this uh and i highly recommend it um the guy contrasts roger federer all-time great who played a lot of sports as a kid with tiger woods who's also really freaking great but had a much different experience growing up and i think has had a much different um childhood a much different adulthood uh, because of the way he was so singularly focused on golf throughout his entire life Michael, I love that question, and I, I would say in that second fork of the road, which here Dr. Z has spent most of the energy here, um, to me it's, it's absolutely spot on. I, I just had a conversation this week with a parent, or parents, of a young man who ironically is not even a wrestler, but rather a soccer player, and they were exploring opportunities and trying to get him you know, he's been selected at the youth level to compete in some world championship opportunities, et cetera. And, and it's like, but listening to the parents, there was this overriding theme again, as like these parents that, and they even qualified their, their statements as, well, we're not one of those parents. We're not <laughs> one of those parents. And so I think the difficult task as coaches is to help parents recognize that their position in this and th that can be very difficult because they see their what they're doing as supportive when in fact they're actually they're pulling the train yeah, yeah. couldn't couldn't agree with you more uh, you know we live in this go 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 work real hard all the time culture we we value monetary and professional success we put professional athletes up on pedestals and we unfortunately perhaps even without meaning to tell our kids okay if you want to get to there you got to specialize you got to dedicate yourself um to a certain extent that's true but you can take anything too far you know if you just if you squeeze your fist forever uh, eventually you run out of energy and if you pursue wrestling with a maniacal focus from age six right on through uh highly unlikely that by the time you get to 18 you're going to be as enthusiastic and as happy and as well developed as you might have been if you would played a few other sports, if you had taken time away from the sport and really see if you, if you care about it. If, if, if you got the talent and the drive to be a world-class wrestler, that's going to come through. You don't have, you don't have to exclusively focus on it uh, from age eight or age 10 or age 12 or even age 14. If you've got the talent, it's going to show up. And, you know, you know, some people are late bloomers. No matter how hard they work, 8, 10, 12, 14, even 16, the, their body just doesn't mature till 17, 18, 19. And all of a sudden, wow, where'd this kid come from? 
know. Yeah, he came from some big city or he came from small some small town. He likes wrestling. He likes to compete. He likes to win. Okay, great. Let's take him. Even though he didn't have that sort of perfect youth wrestling pedigree. Uh, again, another long-winded answer to a very important question. When it sounds like the parents can positively influence that process by doing just what we said to the coaches. Be deliberate in having them we call success. Yeah. Right. If I had a bad practice and I'm in the car ride home and you're drilling me about the bad practice, you're reinforcing the bad practice in my ears. Right. You're basically encouraging me to think about my practice, to think about whatever happened and just take it. You know, this is this is the distinction between very confident people and the average people. The average people are going to have their confidence hinge on whatever just happened. The confident people are going to be very careful about what they think about. Yeah, I, I may have had a bad practice overall, but I'm thinking about that one move that I got. And I'm letting that pleasant memory, constructive memory, be the dominant memory for the day. Even though, even though I might have gotten my butt handed to me, you know, for a lot of the practice, I'm not hanging on to that memory because that really doesn't do me a whole lot of good. I'm hanging on to the memory of making that move or countering that move or just hanging tough, you know, there at the edge of the mat, really going hard when the clock, when I knew the clock was winding, winding down. I'm giving myself credit for that. I'm looking for that kind of evidence. Dr. Z, would you say that that's one of the most predominant negative factors that coaches throw into this mix is the reminding of athletes of mistakes? Um, certainly, we've got to correct mistakes and as coaches, but reinforcing that by overstating it, um, overplaying it. And then uh, sort of as a tag to that question, I would also ask, what are some of the other common mistakes that coaches make in um, dealing with their athletes and building or taking away, stripping confidence? Well, really important question. And I think, I, I don't think there is a coach in the world who says, yeah, I'm a really negative coach and I'm proud of it. Uh, <laughs> no. um, but I think all of us just have to be really careful. What are we communicating? What's our tone of voice? What's the degree of enthusiasm and excitement with which we communicate a technical coaching point? You know, I got a lot of coaches ask me, well, how do I give corrections without coming across like, you know, just, just a nasty hard ass guy? How do I give corrections? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, you've got to, you got you got to make the you got to make the correcting process a collaborative experience, coach. Instead of okay, kid, you got to fix this. It's hey, let's fi let's figure out a way to fix this. Let's work on this together. I got this idea. I think if we can add this, notice I'm using the we, the us, mm -hmm. rather than the you, you, you. Let's try this. I think if you try that and you combine that with some other good qualities that you have, we're really going to create a great outcome. So you need to make the correction as a collaborative experience. You've got to explain why it's a good idea. And you've got to show what connection this correction has to an ultimate desired outcome. And then as soon as you see that correction uh, maintained by the wrestler, you got to be all over them with reinforcement. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. We did it. Nice job. You know, if you make a correction and the kid makes the correction himself and you don't recognize it, less likely the kid's going to hang on to it, you know, because the kid is the kid wants the coach to be, you know, enthusiastic about him or her. That was one of the first things I learned. Um, we had a PhD who was the president of the school that I was coaching at. And he came in the room and 
He said, you clearly know a lot of wrestling, but he said, you would tell this group what they need to fix, and then you would directly go to the next group and tell them what they needed to fix. And he said, you're just bouncing around the room. He said, you don't stay and make sure that what you want them to fix got fixed. So how do you know that what you need them to fix is now fixed if you didn't stick around and walk? And it, there isn't a single day that in this job that I don't think of the lesson that I learned that day right? What, I know what I want to get out of this, but I have to make sure that I put in that last extra effort piece, which is stick around, be that positive influence, and make sure that now we've communicated effectively to improve what needs improving. Yeah. That's tough. That's tough. But hey, this is, this, this is what makes coaching so difficult. This is what can make coaching so valuable and fulfilling when you do make those corrections and you do see that growth. Yeah. Wow. I, I like how you talked about Deion Sanders and his attitude. Um, it, it's such a, a fun part of the book. Um, is that he? Well, now that we've got him in Colorado, uh, mm. I, I think I think you got to get him to come down to the OTC. I mean, come on, fellas. I, I, I think we could get him to come to one of our Silver Coaches colleges. That'd be pretty sweet. Why not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I have a feeling cool. Deion would take you up on it. I, I think he would take you up on it. I think, I think he, he enjoys that type of platform, addressing coaches and having an opportunity to share. He seems like a unique individual. I, I, I certainly have a different opinion of him today than I probably had when he was a professional athlete. <laughs> well, it, it, and you know, Hags, you're you're not alone in that because we recognize in the society that confidence is important. But we also have kind of an ambivalent relationship with it. Like, oh, you better not have too much. You better not talk about yourself. Okay. <laughs> Deion Sanders is one of the rare guys who truly has that internal sense of certainty that we've been talking about. But he is just a naturally outspoken fella. And a lot of the world is uncomfortable with that. You know? We, we, we want our athletes to be the strong, silent types, the quiet professionals. We don't like the Deion Sanders of the world. We don't like, um, well, back in my day, Joe Namath, Muhammad Ali. Um, the list goes on and on. I, you know, Ronda Rousey sort of kind of shot herself in the foot, you know, talking, talking a lot of smack. I mean... We're uncomfortable with that. I think but, uh, I, that's a great point. Um, I'm more tolerant personally of somebody of that nature if I get a chance to know the behind the scene person. If I get to know their heart, then I can deal with that. And that's sort of like I think where I came to terms with like a Dion, uh, you know, a guy that was out there in your face. And then, you know, he became even a sports broadcaster. Uh, for a period of time, and you started to recognize the human side of who this person was and that he was for real. And then as a coach, listening to some of his clips, uh, some of the adversity that he's gone through with his health issues and all the other elements that sort of make up who this guy is, uh, my, my judgment softened quite a bit. And I think that's probably true for most people and that I'm okay with a little bit of the over the top, uh, even if it is true confidence, I'm okay with that. And with the athletes that I've worked with, I'm okay with that. But I better know that they have a sincere and real heart. If, yeah. if all this is is about a show, mm -hmm. then count me out. I'm, right. I'm not on board with that athlete or with that individual in, in life. Couldn't agree more. If they've got the heart, if they've got it on the inside, it's okay for a little of it to come out in the outside. All right. So, you know, please, ladies and gentlemen, don't worry about cultivating confidence. Don't think that you cannot be a modest, polite, pleasant individual and still have a very high opinion of oneself. You know, I think you've got to have that certainty if you're going to perform well in a, in a competitive world. You know, we're talking wrestling here, but it applies in every other sport. It applies in pretty much every other profession. 
you know, and I'm spending my days talking to doctors and entrepreneurs uh, and airline pilots and police officers and firefighters, as well as wrestlers, football players, tennis players, CrossFit athletes, etc. cetera. You, you need to have that internal sense of certainty if you're going to be good, you know, but you also got to be nice on the outside to people if you want to have any friends in this world. <laughs> without without the network, it really serves you no purpose to be confident. Yeah. So, um, and that's sort of to flip this. Is it possible to be successful uh, to any degree without confidence? I suppose if you're freaking lucky, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I'm sure, again, I, I wouldn't want to depend on that sort of luck. Yeah. One of my coach education friends said, I got tired of parents asking me if my son or daughter was going to win an Olympic gold medal. So he said, I would always just turn it back on the parent and say, do you have a mirror in your bedroom? And they're like, well, yeah, we do. He said, okay, well, the two of you parents, you go home tonight. I want you to stand in front of that mirror. And if the reflection you see of the two of you together, if that makes you think Olympic gold medalist, then yeah, your kid has a chance. But understand that that genetic piece is such a big part of that high-performing, elite-level athlete, right? If you don't have the physique, you don't make it. Mm -hmm. This is true. Because there's just too many other parts to the equation, right? Can I be dedicated? Yes. Maybe I'm more dedicated. Maybe I'm more disciplined. But I still have to have the tool. Dr. Z, what would you say would be... Um some of the biggest mistakes that coaches, uh, the boss in the office make in, in, in destroying confidence of either individuals or a team? Um, spending too much time with your starters, your stars, and not enough time with your uh, second tier bench warmers, role players. You know? uh, I would say that the most challenging one of the most challenging things in any sport is being a second stringer or a third stringer, hanging on to your confidence and suddenly being thrust into the starting role because of an injury or whatever, you know? And if you haven't been developed by your coach, if you haven't been encouraged by your coach, well then, wow, you're really at a disadvantage when you are suddenly uh, shoved into the spotlight. So I think a big mistake that a lot of coaches make is spending almost all of their time with their number one guys. Now, I understand that they need to spend time with their number one guys because, hello, the number one guys are going to win a lot of bouts and win a lot of matches. Um, but I am, I, am, I am more impressed by the coaches who do a great job developing their – I hate to use the word marginal athletes, the ones that aren't necessarily the most talented and most precocious. They really do a good job of bringing those guys along and, and getting them to be better, developing them as athletes do, um, making those people feel that they are just as important as, you know, your top rank, the top ranked guys on your team, you know, because those top ranked guys, they're getting what they came for. They're the starter. They're going out there. They're getting written up in the newspapers and on, you know, Intermat and Flow Wrestling, et cetera, et cetera. But how about the guys that are working just as hard in the room that aren't getting that? You know, I think we need to make, we need to find ways of making them really important. You know, practice player of the week award. Um, golden Band-Aid Award, that guy who took the, who, who has the, 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 the best black eye of the week, you know, because he was really in there, you know, uh, grappling hard and going hard and being physical, you know, we need, we need to sort of give those, those awards and that kind of recognition too. I love it. I, I can always tell when I'm speaking to an optimist, when I ask a question about what the coaches do that are on the negative side, and you completely flipped it to speak about what the good ones do. That's, that's the right message right there. So that was, that was awesome. It sounds a little like your first victory is coming out here. 
to know what we need to do to for the coaches to be deliberate. What are those first steps? Are, are, are all of those parts of this first victory concept of the book? Yep. Every one of them. Uh, I was going to actually title the book, the first victory. And then my publisher at uh, Harper Collins said, that's a great title, Dot Nate, and I really like it, but it's going to make people think then, okay, what is the first victory? Well, it's about being confident. Well, why don't we just call it the confident mind and el eliminate that little bit of guesswork? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you think about the, the first victory that you have to win before you can outpoint the guy on the mat. You got to win the victory against your own self-doubt, your own fear of what might happen, your own fear, hello, of your own potential and your own magnificence. You got to win that victory. You know, I start the book and I end the book with the quote from the Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu who said victorious warriors win first and then go into battle while losing warriors go into battle and then hope to win. Okay. Win that first victory. I know what I'm capable of. I can see myself succeeding. Let's go find out how good I am. That's the first victory that allows you to actually step on the mat and let your talent and your training and your motivation really come out and be expressed. And those are the moments that we all live for. Coach Haggerty mentioned this to me years ago. He said, um, I don't set goals anymore. I just make a decision of what I want to be. <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that. If I want to be a runner. What do I do? I get up and I run. Yeah. Right? I get out of bed. I, I, I make the decision of what I want to be. You know, that, that is really an important operative phrase. You know, again, you have free will. You have this decision-making capability. I make the decision to be what I want to be. Keep it simple. I, that's, um, that's sort of how I've always kind of lived my life. You know, that I believe that that's, that's the, the way that we get hung up on goals. Uh, not that goals are a bad thing, but I think goals are only part of a process. And, and if you look at a goal, to me, Mike, in that vein that, hey, this is who I am. This is who I represent. And, uh, I am a runner. If I'm, if I'm not seen as a runner in my mind, setting goals in running makes no sense. Yeah. Right. And that's sort of like, that's sort of how, how I um, phrase it. But um, Dr. T, in this process of, of uh, building confidence, I'm, 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 I'm fascinated in the area of the steps that in your mind would be like from start to finish. And I know that, you know, as you said, confidence is extremely fragile um, and that it, it's not something that is sustainable without maintenance. But what in your mind would be a couple of those or three steps that we could sort of like lay a handle on that as we work with our athletes or we work our, on ourselves individually to build confidence, what would that look like to you? Okay. Well, you can look at the building process in three layers. We've talked a little bit about managing your memory, your thoughts about what happened in the past whether it was five years ago, one year ago, yesterday, or two minutes ago at the conclusion of a drill. Making sure that you are filtering the right memories from your past, and those are sort of entering your long-term storage facility. Secondly, you got to be very careful about the stories you tell yourself about yourself in the present, okay? Oh, I'm good at this. Oh, I'm not good at that. You got to be very careful about that, you know, because those stories that you tell yourself become almost exclusively self-fulfilling prophecies. If I don't think I'm good at getting legs in quickly, okay, then I'm not going to practice doing so with the same degree of enthusiasm that I'm going to practice something that I've made my mind up that I do well. And because I don't practice getting those legs in with the same degree of enthusiasm, I don't develop that skill very well, which just reinforces the belief that I started with. I'm not good at that. So you've got to be very careful about the stories that you tell yourself. And I think it's really okay 
to talk to yourself about what you want as if you have it, even if you don't, you know, um, I'm constantly showing to a lot of clients a list of sort of affirmative affirmation state affirmation style statements that Phil Simpson uh, and I worked up. Phil Simpson was unquestionably the best wrestler in the modern era from West Point, three time All American national runner up. Um, you know, statements about. I lock onto my man like a magnet. I leave him depressed like he just lost the fight. I use my mind better than any of my opponents. Nothing stops me from thinking about kicking ass in my next match. Now, those are statements about how he wants to be. Does he have a little flicker of doubt here and there? Of course, everybody does. But he was very good at retelling himself these stories telling himself these affirmative statements, thinking about how he wanted to be, but not saying, I want to be that way. I am that way. You know? And Phil Simpson would find private spaces, a skip rope, and just keep telling himself, I'm the national champion at 149. I'm the national champion at 149. Phil Simpson, national champion at 149. There's a, there's a great story also about Kyle Dake filling notebooks during his Cornell years. 149 pound NCAA division one national champion. 149 pound division one NCAA national champion. You know, before he was a national champion, he was thinking I am. So the stories that you tell yourself in the present about yourself are another huge component of, of thinking effectively, thinking constructively. Uh, and then the third component is what you do with your imagination about the future. What do you see in that mind's eye of yours? You know, do you see yourself on that podium? Can you feel that podium underneath your feet? Can you imagine looking out at the crowd? You know, when you're on that podium, when I, you know, I spent some time with some, Folks training for the Olympic Games, um, bobsled, track, biathlon. Can you actually hear the national anthem being played during the medal ceremony? Can you see yourself there? Now, can you see yourself doing the things that are going to get you there? Okay. Can you create in your own mind a short video of you succeeding at the Olympic trials, of you succeeding at the games? Can you create a video in which you are taking that guy down? And if you don't already, if, if you haven't beaten that guy already in your mind before you step on the mat against him, um, I think you've, already, you, you've just given him an advantage. You gotta beat him in that theater of your mind before you can actually beat him on the mat. And some, some wrestlers are very hesitant to do that. Well, I haven't beaten him on the mat yet. How can I beat him in my imagination? To which I answer, how can you not? What the heck is stopping you from creating a video in that wonderful studio that you've got there? What the heck is stopping you from seeing the mat you're going to be on, the arena you're going to be in, feeling the singlet on you, headgear on you, jumping up and down and taking the mat and then doing what you do, doing the wrestling the match of your dreams against any opponent. Um, how you think about your future is really huge. And I, I, I advise people to really understand that when you make those pictures and you get those feelings, it's kind of like a nightmare. You feel your body, you know, shift and uh, twitch. It's like, yeah, you're, you're actually communicating through your imagination all the way through your nervous system and your muscles react to it. There's a lot of science about just how that mental picture creates nervous impulses that go right to the motor end plate in your muscles. So you can get wonderful mental reps and you can get a wonderful emotional pre-win um, if you use your imagination. Uh, 
So I'm really big on that. Those are so those are sort of the three categories, if you will, coach. You got to be effective in how you think about your past. You got to be effective in how you think about yourself in the present. And you got to be really effective, really constructive in how you think about your future. If you That's if you've done a whole lot of that then it's much easier to actually bring confidence uh, to a match. To it a gives me a point of reference. I love that, that, that um, sort of this analysis of, of the past, a visit to the past, um, uh, and then a, a, a perspective of where you're at presently, and then futuristically looking to uh, the visualization skills, et cetera, putting yourself in that place before you actually visit it. And, you know, I, to share a quick story along that same vein, uh, this was years and years ago that I had a chance to visit with Kendall Cross. And it <laughs> wasn't long after Kendall had won the Olympics. It was probably four or five years after he'd won the Olympics. And I said, and we all saw from, you know, the memories of watching that on television, Kendall running with the flag on his back through the gymnasium and all of that and how spectacular that was. And then, but at the same time, you know, I kind of wanted to know, you know, what was the underlying thought process after, immediately after winning it. I said, Kendall, what do you remember? And what was that feeling like? And he said, in the exact moment that he had won the Olympics, when that first hit him, it wasn't that big of a deal because he had done it so many times before. And that's exactly how he phrased it. I'd done it over and over again. <clears throat> and obviously he wasn't speaking about previous Olympics. He was speaking of his ability to visualize that moment prior to it actually happening. All right. So he basically created a deja vu experience for himself. Right. I've been here before, mm -hmm. <laughs> even though on one level of analysis, he hasn't, but his nervous system doesn't know the difference between him actually being at the Olympics and him vividly envisioning being at the Olympics and scoring points and winning matches and running around the mat with the American flag draped over his shoulders. Well, it was his nervous system impactful. doesn't know the difference between that actual experience and the vividly envisioned experience. I think and that's an interesting advantage of that. It's incredibly important point, Doctor Z, is that that our n nervous system doesn't recognize the difference. That it is the same, the same experience of whether it's really happening or whether it's mentally being framed in that same respect. And and I'm sure that when when you work with individuals, that's something that is important to try to get to the to that point where. They are experiencing that. Um, I know it's 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 hard uh, if you've never done it before, but certainly as athletes, uh, if you can get athletes to project themselves into that that visualization perspective and that that point in their in their uh, competition, it's huge. It it is a wonderful advantage to have, and it's a wonderful gift that every athlete can give to him or herself. Certainly. Mike, I just love wow. this. I this, is, uh, this is fantastic. And I, it's like I was so excited to have an opportunity to visit with you, Dr. Z. Is anything else that you could share with us before we, uh, we we're well over the, the 60 minute mark, but it's, it's well worth that. But anything else that you would like to share at this particular um, time? I, and, and, and certainly no shameless plug for the, for the book. We'd love to promote your book. So, well, th yeah, th thank you for promoting the book. Um, nothing would please me more than to have it be required reading for every, you know, every high school and every college athlete. Um, don't know if that's going to happen. I'm not the president of the United States or anything like that. Um, I, but I appreciate you plugging the book. Um, I'll just conclude with just, basically the concluding point of the book. And that is, Hey, guess what? You can change your mind. You know, you can change your mind from worry and doubt and fear to excitement and possibility and certainty. Every human being can do that. All right. You, you do not have to be, you know, a member of Mensa uh, or an AP student to do that. 
It has nothing to do with quote unquote intelligence. Okay. Everybody can change their mind. And the second thing is it's, you're going to have to change your mind a lot in this imperfect world that we all experience. Um, the final story in the book is from a retired four-star general who talks about a terrible tragedy that uh, occurred during his deployment, his deployment uh, in Iraq. Um, but despite this tra tragedy, he and his team had to go to work that very night and they had to continue to work. Okay. And the, the phrase that he used that sticks with me and that I'd share with everybody is faith takes practice. Faith takes practice. We think of the word faith as something that just sort of magically comes and there it is. No, faith is a long haul process. Faith takes practice. Okay. Don't be afraid of the practice. Change your mind as often as you need to so that you give yourself the opportunity to be as good as you can be whenever you want to be. Uh, if you can take, if, if your coaches can take away that message and find their own unique, authentic way to communicate it to young wrestlers, um, that I think is just a, a wonderful, a wonderful legacy to leave. I think this podcast and your book are two key ingredients to start anybody off in that direction. Thank you. Clayton, thank you. Hags, this has been a wonderful hour. Yeah, appreciate sure, it. Sure, appreciate your time, Dr. Z. Um, it, it, real quick, before we do sign off, what's the best way to uh, purchase your book? Is there um, through um, Amazon? Oh, you can purchase the book uh, pretty much anywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads, uh, Audio. Audible. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's an Audible version. There's an e-book version. There's the hardcover version. Um, at some point, it'll be a paperback, but right now I think hardcover is it. Um, you know, if you happen to be traveling in England, you can find it too. You know, there's a UK edition. Um, and Mike, so, we can certainly add those to the show notes. So, yeah, every uh, um, pretty much wherever books are sold, um, you, you can find it. We'll make sure to put a link for your uh, website for natezinzer.com in the bio for this as well. That would be great. I have been contacted by over a hundred different folks in every sport and profession imaginable through that website. And um, let's have let's have some more wrestlers. That'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope we uh, get an opportunity to meet and, and face 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 to face, Doctor Z, sometime at maybe a wrestling competition down the road. So. I uh, look forward to that chance uh, that that takes place. And uh, Mike, it's always good to see you again. Yes. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, look forward to this upcoming season and the wrestling community. So uh, for everybody out there, this has been uh, Mike and Mike again on the mic <laughs> for Heads Up Podcast. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, Coach.